Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the closing plenary. We are definitely on the home stretch of the Snake Conference. Man, am I going to have a rest after this? My name is Desley Thompson. I'm a Warraburra woman from the Mamu Nation of Far North Queensland. I'm Deputy Chair for Child and Family Wel Welfare of Snake and also the Chair of the Snake Conf Conference Expert Advisory Group. Before I introduce the next performers, I would like to acknowledge the tra traditional owners and custodians of the lands in, in and around Cairns and pay my respects to the elders past and present and future. I also pay respects to the elders in this room. I tell you what, it's so good to see that we can still tell our stories no matter what, hey, through all different kinds of um, performances. It's just wonderful. Our next speaker, first of all, I want to thank um, our sponsor, Berry Street, for supporting our next keynote speaker. Professor Judy Atkinson is a Yiman and Jungalung woman, board member of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Healing Foundation, patron of the Wee Alley Trust, and former head of the Southern Cross University's Nimbai College of Indigenous Australian Peoples. Judy was made an emeritus professor by South Cross, sorry, from Southern Cross University recently in recognition of her outstanding contribution to the area of Indigenous trauma and healing and recovery. Judy also ran a pre-conference workshop in, on Monday, a session yesterday, and a concurrent session earlier today. So we are pleased now to hear about working together to heal, heal generational trauma within Aboriginal children and their families. Please welcome to the, to the stage, Professor Judy Atkinson. Before I start, I want to name something that I think is very important. I think I'm going to cry. <laughs> the most powerful thing that I have experienced since I've been sitting here in this conference is to see the children getting up every morning and dancing. Uh, I sat through a conference once where Geraldine Doog announced just after some children had come in and danced like that, she said, wasn't it good to have that entertainment? That was not entertainment. That was healing at its deepest level. It's a continuation of culture across generations and the way that we heal in song, dance and ceremony. And what we're doing now today is we're teaching our children or our children are taking the lead in doing that for us. So the first thing I want to do as I recognise that I'm here in Gamayan Dindji land is to recognise our children. We are our children's future. I want you to think about that for a while. I've lived and worked in uh, this region, lived and worked up in the Cape communities and I have a, a, a very strong memory of uh, the lands of this place, the elders. The, uh, the ancestors, the leaders who have taught me in ways I should walk. So I want to recognise that and I want to recognise that in this room there are more people who are sitting out there who are more worthy of being up here than I am. It's important that we recognise all our work. And I particularly chose that uh, photo as I want to recognise the... Uh, ongoing generations of people who've been part of this great country we now call Australia um, and the Torres Straits, who in life cycles have continued the regeneration of our cultures. On the 28th of uh, January 1988, Miriam Rose Angamar stood in Tasmania and presented to the Australian nation uh, to Deary, the Aboriginal gift to the nation, how we listen to each other. Part of my theme today is that we haven't been listening well enough. And as I go around and I work across Australia in different places, I asked each language group to tell me what their word is. So I just thought I'd um, allow you, just like if I was in, uh, in Inuit, Inuit country and I asked them to give me the word for uh, uh, snow, there, there would be 40 or 50 different uh, der derivations of what snow means. 
So listening within an Aboriginal space is to be able to hear each other in contemplative reciprocal relationships. And down in the APY lands in Pitinjara country, they gave me two separate words. One was listening, to listen. And the other was really deep listening and wanting to listen. What do I mean by that, wanting to listen? And it'll come out in my theme. Back home in my own country, Bunjalung country, and I probably won't leave there. I've been travelling for quite some years of my life. Uh, the, the word gunner means to hear, to listen, to feel, to feel. Oh, so when we listen, we're allowed to feel too. And in feeling, we then think, and then we understand. And finally, in Gumbungee country, they introduced another concept. Hearing and learning and understanding, and then knowing from the heart. So when I was up uh, in the Cape many years ago and we started to expand on, when I was doing the violence report for the Queensland Government with Bunny Robinson, one of the women there said, hey, hey, wait a minute here, wait a minute here. I'm thinking and I'm feeling. And she had the thinking place here and the feeling place here. And I remember watching her in the animation of what she was trying to say to us. I want you to know what the children are going through here. I'm thinking and I'm feeling as I talk to you. And here was her thinking place, her heart place. So maybe we as Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people have something to teach the broader Australian nation and the rest of the world, that we have to be a feeling people. I've learned from the past, and I've learned way back from the past on, um, I'll just see if I can stop that from popping. Um, on Monday, I'm not going to go into any deep analysis of trauma, but on Monday I described uh, in the workshop I did on children at risk, the generational story that is part of my story. And afterwards, one of the pers people in the room came up and said to me, I am related to you. My great-grandfather was Henry Williams and my great-grandmother was Eliza Shields and I am the great-grandchild of one of their children. And I smiled to myself because I had actually, I had never met her, but I had actually been able to chart the family lines of all of those 13 children and how they moved into a healing process or they continued down the track to um, a distressed process. But I particularly want to focus today on the very, very recent past, around about 2005. I was working across Australia after people, I never ever go into a community unless I'm invited. People will ring up and say, um, look, you know, we've seen the work you do, we've just had 21 arrests on child sexual assault, would you please come? And I never say no when I, somebody asks that. We've just had a suicide here, a little girl, you know, she hung herself, she's been bashed, stabbed, raped, would you come? And I never say no, but I will negotiate. I will come, but I will not come for just a couple of days or a week. Um, we will start to work with government to see if we can get something in place for it's a longer period of time. Healing takes longer than just a couple of days workshop or a week's workshop. So I was working across borders. <coughs> and believe me, um, there is uh, differences between the ways that different states respond to the needs of Aboriginal children. I'm going to now focus on Aboriginal children because I am not a Torres Strait Islander person. Um, so, in the Kimberley region, down across the APY lands in Western New South Wales and Southern Queensland, I was working across these places. And at the same time, and there was a conglomerate, a, a, a mixture of things that I was being asked to do. Generally, in crisis, a response to crisis situations, a murder of a woman, uh, suicides of children, sexual assault issues, high levels of violence. And I started to think that these all represent the symptoms, the histories of what's come out, the symptoms of history. And I happened to be invited down to Canberra. So my theme for this particular slide is I went to seek partnerships with the government. I uh, was walking around the house and I stumbled into um, the Attorney General's Philip Ruddock's office. And I just wanted to have a look, in fact, because I have quite a deep cynicism about government. But I stumbled into his office and I got talking to one of his chief policy advisers. And his chief policy advisor said to me, Mr. Rudd would, uh, Mr. Ruddock would really like to talk to you. And I thought, oh, OK. He said, would you come back to Canberra? 
he's not here at the moment, would you come back to Canberra and talk to him? And I thought, well, that's a good opportunity. If I'm going to do that and they're going to fund me, I will make the time to meet with all of the other ministers. So I did that. I actually set up a meeting with the Minister for Health and the Minister for Education, the Minister for Families and the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, the Minister for Employment. And so I came down with an outline of what I was going to suggest that they do, that they fund in a partnership between each of the government departments, five years of response to these different areas that I was working in. And I had a group of uh, students who had graduated from the masters who were moving into postgraduate PhD study. So I was wanting to locate them there. Now, this is the story I want to tell you. Um, I went into the Minister for Education. He could become our Prime Minister shortly. Sorry, the Minister for Health. He could become our Prime Minister shortly. And I will never forget that his Chief Policy Advisor sat with me for maybe five minutes and then got irritated and said, well, can't your people just get over it? And I opened my mouth and then I took a deep breath because I didn't want to be rude. And I said, well, well, yes, actually, like Vietnam vets, get over it. Like people with cancer, just get over it. With, like people with diabetes, just get over it. With, like people who've got asthma, just get over it. They don't need medical attention, do they? They don't need your services, do they? And he looked at me and he could see I've got a glint in my eye when I get angry. And he knew that I was angry, so we actually did settle down to a bit of a conversation. I then went on to the next meeting place, and it was the Minister for Education at that time, and he's now left government. And uh, there was about 40 people sitting in this room, and the most senior person in the Department of Education in Canberra sat in that room and said to me, and my proposal was that we take an educaring model out into the communities, that we um, skill people up in communities to deliver their own services and that they would get a formal qualification from it. And that would be Aboriginal people who had already graduated from a master's course would be delivering it. And another group of Aboriginal people would be doing the research. And I wanted to combine these sites so I could do a cross-site analysis of what worked. And this woman, non-Indigenous woman, looked at me and said, well, look, you know, I mean, your people wouldn't be able to cope with anything except a TAFE certificate one level. And I stood up and the chair fell over and I said, excuse me, I am an Aboriginal person, I have a PhD. My daughter is an Aboriginal woman, she has a PhD. I know many Aboriginal people and I have graduated now over 60 master's students. They're all Aboriginal people and they've got master's level qualifications. And my voice started to rise a bit more and my boss who was sitting with me at the time looked at me and went And I thought, I'm out of here. And I walked out. And then I went on to talk to Pat Giles, and she was actually really worthwhile talking to, I have to say that. And then I went on to talk to the Minister for Indigenous Affairs at that time, Amanda Vanstone. And she said, um, will you work at Montajula? And I went, well, I haven't been invited to work at Montajula, and I never go where I'm not invited, but I've given you five sites across three states that I have an invitation to work with for over five years. So why would you put that one at me? She says, well, we've removed the pedophile now. And I went, I don't need to continue this conversation either. My final conversation, however, I guess what I'm doing is looking at, this is the uh, diagram I, I presented to them at the time, that we place the children in the centre of what we're doing that their families and their communities are part of how we're engaging with the children. That the Aboriginal organisations and the NGOs are also part of the engagement that we have with those children. And that we actually focus on education as the way forward. So we're skilling up a workforce. And we're skilling up a workforce located within communities. And because I was interested in showing them what works, we embody that within research so that we document it over a five year period. So they were the funding bodies, so I was wanting to engage with them. So finally, finally, um, a new fellow came in, and his name was Marlborough Man, Marlborough. And he was kind of interested in one particular site, so he told me to go to see his uh, funding people. And we sat in a room, 
uh, two senior people from my university and I, and we had nutted out this proposal in depth. We had rewritten it I don't know how many times. By the way, uh, the person who was in charge of employment thought that this was not an employment issue for Aboriginal people. So when I'm suggesting that we employ our own mob out there to do the job. But the final reason why I learned from the past and I walked away from it was this. We sat in that room, we were nutting out a funding proposal, very, very solid funding proposal. And just as we got to walk out, and she said to us, this woman, oh, you need to rewrite this. And I thought, okay, this will be about the seventh time I've rewritten this document. And as we went to walk out, she turned to me and she said, you don't think all this talk about child sexual assault is just false memory syndrome, do you? And I lost it. I spun around, pointed it like this, and I said, you know, that little five-year-old child that drowned while she was being only raped, she doesn't have a memory, she's dead. And I have a memory and I will never, ever forget you. And I never have. And I actually walked out of that building and I rang up the minister's office and said, if you don't do something now about the quality of staff that you have employed in your department, I will go to the media. And I have found that I didn't have the energy any longer to engage with that model that I was trying to promote. So learning in the present, learning today, generational learning. I'm engaged with the school at the moment. I actually, there's one more story I want to tell you. Um, the day Kevin Rudd was elected Prime Minister, I wrote to him. A week previously, one of my masters had sent me an email. And it was an email that stop, stopped my heart. She had been just finishing the master's degree and she got a call from home. And what had happened is that she was fourth generation that had been removed. And the department in that particular state had decided to remove her two nieces, a six-year-old and an eight-year-old child. And the day that Kevin Rudd was elected Prime Minister, five squad cars of police and two unmarked departmental cars, seven cars turned up to take two children from their grandmother's home because they had determined that these children needed to be in care. While the woman who was finishing her masters, who had developed the whole social emotional wellbeing program for CAMS in, in Broome, was begging them to let her be the carers, the family carers of these children. So what I've done is locate you in what I think is quite severe dysfunction at some levels of government. I just want to touch for a moment, and I don't want to belabor this point at all. What we're looking at today is symptom as history. And we're saying to each other that things have got worse. Well, of course they've got worse. They've got worse because we've been talking. And we've been talking and talking and talking until we're tired. We've been out there working and I can see all of you who have been working on the ground for so long and you're tired and people have not, people in power have not been listening. So I thought I presented this story quickly. On, I'm just going to present it. I'm not going to do a generational story, Graham. The story of Dolly... Dolly was uh, removed from the first protector in North Queensland in 1906 from the station property where she'd been living. Uh, she had been taken there for whatever reason we don't know when she was two years of age. And at the time that she was removed, she was 13. She had been from the age of two to 13, the kitchen hand in that station property, just south of that community that got me uh, moving on the pathway I'm on now. At the time of her removal by the Chief Protector, Walter Roth, she had two things that she owned in her life. She'd never been paid a wage for the 11 years that she worked as a kitchen hand in this, uh, on this station property. And the two things she owned was these two little Hessian maternity smocks that covered her little 13-year-old body, which was seven and a half months pregnant. I have sat with that story over the years, and it's well documented. She was taken to Yarraba. Um, and I have wondered how she became a mother, because she never had women around her to show her how to become a mother. She was taken to a reserve, as it was determined at that time, and there she gave birth. And I wondered whether I have sat with um, the generations that have come from that birth in the rehab centre here and other places. I don't know. So I want to locate generational trauma for this moment outside of Australia in South America. And this is Marita Blanco's work, so let's just kind of go through it very quickly. 
In the first generation of colonisation, males are killed, imprisoned and females are sexually misused. In the second generation, men turn to alcohol or other drugs as their cultural and spiritual identities are damaged and their self-worth is eroded, so that's what we call historical cultural trauma. Into the third generation, we see spousal assault starting to come, social trauma. The fourth generation, abuse moves from spousal assault to child abuse or both. And there we have the complex and the developmental trauma which I'm working with at the moment in the communities where I'm working. In the fifth generation, the cycle starts to repeat against itself as trauma begets violence begets trauma. And that's what we're dealing with today. And this is the interesting one because this is the one where most white fellows sit up and go, wow, the grown children of the conquerors begin to live in fear of the grown children of the conquered. So sometimes I go to places and the elders will say to me, make sure you don't go down there because we have no control of our kids any longer. They are acting out in ways that we've never seen them acting out before. And they're acting out not just on their own communities now, but they're starting to act out. So to go back to that conversation um, in Canberra, I did go to see uh, Philip Ruddock and we had a big talk about um, the... Uh, role of the Attorney Generals and uh, restorative justice and things like that to start to address some of the issues in our communities. And then he started to talk to me about, well, your people, you know, I mean, that's cultural, isn't it, the way your people behave, you know, and the way that men are raping women. And I had a big fight with him in the office and then he smiled in his supercilious way and he turned the brief around and he said, if you challenge her, she will challenge you right back. And so my final words to him was, you know, Mr. Ru Mr. Ruddock, each time you build a new prison, you build a terrorist training centre. And God help us in 50 years' time, because we have kids now who are going through ju juvenile justice in adult prison, and they have no idea why they're violent. They have no, have no idea why they're angry. They're just angry. And they're out there acting it out on others. And he stopped, um, and he became serious again. He listened. But they never did anything. So trauma can become generational until, unless healed. And I'm just going to touch on a couple of things. Collective trauma is the psychological blow to the basic tissues of social life that damage the bonds attaching people together and impairing the prevailing sense of community. And trauma can be not just the way we've been colonised, but can, can evolve from uh, natural disasters. And I have uh, some very solid analysis of the Cape communities where there's been a cyclone and the way the government has intervened has increased the trauma in that community, increased the distress in that community. There comes a gradual realisation that the community no longer exists as a source of nutrients and that part of the self has disappeared. And I see that a lot. Historical trauma is the collective emotional and psychological injury in the life of an individual or of a community, both over the lifespan and across generations. So there is cause and effect, and I just want to touch on this one briefly, because this, the, as they describe the destruction of our cultural worldviews, which have sustained indigenous peoples across millennia, we're talking here about a collective experience, not just an Aboriginal Australian experience, but also the Yupik of Alaska, the Navajos. And I was in Navajo country some time ago, uh, a number of years ago, looking at the impacts of uranium mining on the Navajo populations. And nobody wanted to even talk about that. I was actually in universities in the United States who didn't even acknowledge that that was an issue. Hawaiian natives, the Maori in New Zealand, and of course ourselves. And we've all experienced similar but different impacts of colonisation. However, we all have very similar stats. I'm not big on stats. I actually want to focus on two issues. I mean, I think stats are great and charts are fabulous. They get us to look very quickly at something and the stats are up here. But I think we need to be listening to each other more particularly. And so I hear people say to me, it's about grief. And I think, well, not quite. It's uh, something different. But then I say, I hear people say that we've got a workforce that we need to support. This photo is um, at the end of the loss and grief workshop we did for the master's course. When I asked the students to develop something that they wanted to talk about, and they went out for a while to do that, and I saw this particular woman go into almost a trance state, and she went out and raided the garden. And that particular reef is almost as big as a room. It just becomes something she just kept adding to it and adding to it and adding to it. 
And as we sat down then to hear her story, she was a uh, social scientist, a, uh, she was uh, a, a counsellor, and the story was that 10 years previously her partner had suicided. And her workmates had told her that she just had to move on. Really? You don't just move on when somebody dies. So let's just have a look at the difference between grief and trauma so that you get an understanding of that because we need to think about this. Grief generally does not attack or disfigure our identity, whereas trauma generally attacks and distorts and disfigures who we are. So we begin to under question ourselves in our cultural and spiritual identities. In grief, Gil says, well, I wish I could have. I wish I hadn't been there. But in trauma, Gil says, it was my fault. I could have prevented it. It should have been me. In trauma, dreams tend to be of the person who has died. In grief, in trauma, dreams are about the child, him or herself dying or being hurt, and we're working with a number of children who are having those kinds of dreams at the moment, and, and the suicide ideation that goes with that. Generalised reaction of grief is sadness, and the generalised reaction um, in trauma is terror. Grief reactions can stand alone, but trauma reactions generally also include grief, grief reactions. In grief, pain is related to the loss. In trauma, pain is related to the tremendous terror and an overwhelming sense of powerlessness and fear for safety. Grief reactions are generally known to the public and the professional, so we see them and we name them. And we as professionals, and I'm assuming you all are at different levels, will talk about the grief, the, the, the layered grief within our communities, in our people. But trauma reactions, especially in children, are largely unknown to the public and quite often to professional counsellors as well. So we need to think about that and we need to hear the stories deeper than the, the stories that present. In grief, a child's anger is generally not destruct destructive. But in trauma, a child's anger often becomes assaultive. Even after nonviolent trauma, fighting often increases. In other words, after a, uh, a cyclone, a, a bus crash or something like that. And finally, trauma reactions, I want you to, to think about this in your work. Trauma reactions are different from grief, grief reactions. Trauma reactions overpower, overwhelm grief reactions. So what we are presented with when we're working with young people, children, their mums, their dads. Children can be traumatised by violent or non-violent incidents, separation from a parent through divorce or foster care, forced removal, a family member's terminal illness or a sudden death, exposure to physical or sexual abuse, witnessing drug use, witnessing drug use, house fires, tornadoes or cyclones, whatever you want to call them here, flood earthquakes, as well as drowning, murder, suicide and school violence. So I think it's important that we really get a, a clear understanding of what trauma does to human populations, particularly our children today, because I think that gives us a, some kind of a theory base to what we were talking about early today, the increased, the increasing removal of children without the adequate services they, they deserve as part of their human rights. So learning from the future. Now, I, um, I rang somebody up last night, actually she rang me first and then I asked her if I have permission to, to tell a couple of stories and I do have, so I'm going into that in a minute. So the models of practice I wanted to touch on are not great big area for, you know, great big things that other people can't do. They're very basic. A transformational learning model designed to provide opportunities for children to learn at their optional levels, optional levels while receiving therapeutic care in the learning environment. Now, when Mulligan was doing his re, uh, stuff in the AP Waylands, he asked me, would we place, and I heard yesterday in a keynote presentation, the services that we need within a healthcare system. And I said, no, we need to place them in the education system because every single child has a basic human right to education. And so let's start where the schools are. But the schools that I was looking at in the APY lands had 13 keys to get in and out of every room and it had a barbed wire fence around it that was about eight foot high. So some schools have become like prisons. So I started to play around with this thing called education, educaring, uh, from the, the Greek from the Latin, to rear up, to nurture the children, to draw out from them, to lead, to show the way. 
And the model I decided to work with, therefore, was to get rid of the three R's, reading, writing and arithmetic, and start to work with the seven R's. Rights, respect, responsibility, reciprocity and relatedness, and resilience and resonance. So, each child should be conceived and born into the world with respect for the innate beauty of that child. The unique human being that that child is, there is not another human being on the planet that is exactly that child. And I talk to this when I'm working with young people who are at the stage when they want to get into bed with each other. You want to do that? Well, have a think about what you may be creating. Because if you can't respect the act that you're about to get into, then you won't respect in a good way the child that you're about to bring into the world. Every child has rights. They're basic human rights. The right to be safe, to be protected, allowed to grow and learn at their optimal level within cultural and spiritual ways of being in the world, at home, within the school, the community, and in the services that they're um, receiving. And I actually love this photo. It's not a photo from Australia. It's a photo from uh, Africa, but I just like it because you see the child emulating the parent. And how often do our children do that with us? If we treat children with respect and they receive rights to clean water, good food, loving care, then they themselves learn responsibility. And they learn to make life choices for themselves and they regulate their own behaviour. And I've seen that over and over again. It's part of the, the core functions of Indigenous child rearing practices. And it's beautiful to see children who can be respectful of other people. I want to stop for a moment now and I want to go back to the, the grief cycle. And I want to tell you a story about my grandchildren who could show deep respect at a time of, of great distress. Um, on the 28th of February, my husband died. He had been in prison for... Uh, sorry, in prison. He wasn't in prison. He was in prison. He was actually in, an, in a prison that, was part, uh, that had been made for him when he was first put into an institution. So most of his life was a prison without walls where he was contained within his own pain. And we did, had to do a lot of healing work over the years to get us to a family to be functional again, to... Um, help him heal from what had happened to him, to help me heal from what had happened to me, and to recognise as parents that we had impacted on our children in ways that weren't good for them. So we had organised over a year ago a family reunion for all my grandkids to come and all of the different members of the family to come into the one place. And then he got cancer, pancreatic cancer, and uh, it was a very quick time between his diagnosis and when he died. Although we knew he'd had cancer, we hadn't realised that he had two forms of cancer. So I had spent 10 days in the hospital room with him and every day I would ask one of the children to come in and sit and talk with him and the grandchildren came up and then on the morning of the 28th of February, he died. And it was a beautiful experience being with him and seeing that there was a completion of a life and that he was able to talk to us and lay to rest all of the pain that he'd carried throughout his life. And there was deep forgiveness for his parents for um, maintaining his place in that institution where he'd been placed. They hadn't wanted to recognise and acknowledge that there was quite a high level of violence on his body at that time. So I ran my family um, as soon as it started to get towards daylight to tell them that he had um, passed. And so my grandchildren were told, and my grandchildren in the house at that time ranged from 21 years of age to um, four years of age. But my um, eight-year-old granddaughter then informed the rest of the family, her parents and her uncles and aunts, that she needed to go up to the hospital and that they needed to come with her because she needed to say goodbye to Poppy. So they all get in the car and they come up to the hospital and this little girl went out into the street. Now the first thing she did, she brought up a lot of post-it notes and she gave a post-it note to all the adults and all the children and they wrote messages to their, their poppy and to their father and father-in-law. And then she took her uncle out into the street with her and she raided all the gardens along the street and she bought all the flowers she collected and she bought it back and she decorated the whole bed and she was still there when the doctor walked in to do the necessary things to sign the death certificate. And as he got to the room, he stopped and he started to cry. And he said, I've never seen anything like this before. 
He said, this is the most healthy thing I've ever seen in my life. Thank you. And he gave the kids a hug. My point in telling you that story is that children teach us. They teach us what we need to know and what we need to do. And this little girl of eight taught us something important. There is reciprocity in what we do. That's the whole essence of being Aboriginal, sharing and caring as a Ubiut word, but I was looking for the R words. It's embodied within the principles of how we care for each other and look after each other. The two photos here is one of the communities that I was working in, and I don't think you can see their faces that much, but you can see that the women were sitting over here working and the men were sitting over here working, and they were talking about the really deep and distressing problems in the community, and then they came back together to talk to each other. Reciprocity is when we share those things that are deeply concerning with each other and how we then support each other to work together to make changes in our communities, in our families, in the lives of our children. And relatedness. If you look at this photo, you see the eyes of the grandmother and the grandson, and they're just identical, and they're just looking at me with this, 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 there was a deep love in this elder woman who was so concerned for the small children in her community. Relatedness, how the child engages in the world in which they live and learn. And that world is a world of relationships. And I just want to acknowledge the presentation by Gotha. That was the most important presentation that I've sat through here. Because if we had... That school doesn't need to worry about trauma-informed. It's already helping children live in the world, a world that is a natural environment and they're healing over and over again in spite of the pressures from outside. If we could transform, clone, transform, uh, transport, clone that school into other places, we would have a healthy healing country. Resilience is the next R word. Resilience, I hear this word a lot and it just it used to piss me off, actually, because at one stage, every time I went to a conference, all the white workers were standing up and talking about attachment theory. And I go, oh, yeah. And then they started to talk about resilience as though it was the end of the world. Yeah, we've got to breed up a group of resilient children. Well, resilience is about flexibility, hardiness. And the photo there is a young woman in Papua New Guinea who at 16 years of age set herself for light. She was so tired of the violence on her body, and she had 95% burns to her body. And she's sitting there when we were doing a workshop in Papua New Guinea and she's doing her story map for us. And you see that she has a little bubber in her arms. The um, bandage on her arm is permanent from the damage that the, uh, the fire on her body did to her. She's, got now, she's now got three children and she's incredibly resilient. But more importantly, she also emanates resonance, the language of the heart. Resonance is about empathy, character, moral fibre. It's the heart brain. The feeling place in here, which is the, mas uh, the marsupial brain linked to the prefrontal lobes and the neocortex. And it allows us to engage with each other in reciprocal relationships, empathizing. A person who has resonance can't hurt another person because if you resonate with the other when they're hurting, your whole body hurts as well. People hurt when they're acting out the trauma, the violence on them, when they're so disconnected from themselves that they can't feel the pain they're, they're, they're impacting on another. So I have permission to name the Barwon Learning Centre. I had a phone call last night from the principal of the Barwon Learning Centre. Um, I'm just going to finish with this in these two slides. Um, the protocols, we started off by being invited by the principal to engage with the learning centre. This learning centre was set up in 2007 by New South Wales Education as a catchment for all the kids who had been booted out of every other school in the region, right? These kids have been suspended or, or expelled from every school. So this was a school that wasn't delivering at all, at all. And the principal was asked to, the, prin the present principal was asked to uh, consider taking on the job. So she rang me and said, can we um, sit down and develop a plan of action? And we did. For a couple of weeks, we sat on my veranda and we mapped out what we would do. So we developed principles and protocols for engagement. And we decided that we would place the cent at the centre of every, uh, all the work that we did, the rights of the child. And we decided that if we could get something moving, that we would actually work in a healing way with the children. That we would start to inspire the teachers who were not functioning too well at that time to learn from the children, to listen to the children. So that the teachers could see that the children's behaviour had meaning, symptoms, history. 
that we wanted to open the centre up to the families, the carers, the community. So it became a healing learning centre, an environment that we then wanted to move out and engage with the broader educational and adult health professions because we thought we needed to skill a workforce that we wanted to engage with the funding bodies and we did that over and over again and again we got kind of booted this way and that way as the New South Wales Department, the New South Wales Government tried to sort itself out and I'm not responsible for their dysfunction. I'm responsible for how I engage in the world around me. And finally we went to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Healing Foundation and was asked if we could get support from them to research what works as we were working with the school. So one person can make a difference what happened is this principle has made a difference. Last night I got a phone call. Um, this is to me the most magic thing I've ever heard. She decided she's been working with these kids and some of these kids have got the most tragic trauma stories you could think of. And the reason why they're not allowed in the other schools is because of their extreme behaviours. But what happened yesterday was that she had divided the classrooms to boys and girls and a group of little girls, we heard this morning, we've heard people talk about listening to children. Sometimes children can't talk. But what happened yesterday is three of the little girls in that classroom asked the teachers to come into that classroom and sit with another little girl. And then they told the story that that little girl had been sharing with them of where she was in placement care, in foster care, where she was being sexually abused. She hadn't felt powerful enough to share it with anybody else, including the department, but she'd shared it with her classmates. And they decided that they would share that with the teacher. I would just like to take a moment and drink this good clean water to children who care for other children and who will speak up on behalf of children. We need to hear those voices. And we've been in, and last night I heard also that uh, the mother of uh, this little girl's mother has been killed, so she doesn't have a mother, but another of another child has come to the school asking for help, and the father has been asking for help, and yet the department has said that this particular family is too at risk to work with. They're not a family that their department workers um, feel safe in working with, and yet the family has now walked into the school and asked for help. And the community, and I could name some very powerful people from this community in Barwon, is Moree. So you'll think about the Freedom Rides and the swimming pool. Uh, this community has now gone and said to other places that they want to clone this school across the region. So that's a vote from the community itself about the changes that are starting to happen. And the government agencies are starting to be uh, challenged. The other thing I heard yesterday was that uh, uh, a little fellow who's been acting out, he actually uh, walked in front, he tried to walk in front of a truck the other day. The truck missed him, the semi-trailer missed him by about two inches. The uh, four-wheel drive that was following on from the truck actually had to swerve off the road and crash to avoid this little fellow. He was in a total trance state as he did that. He has previously tried to harm himself, but this time he thought he was going to do it proper on the road. And so the school principal asked if they could have an assessment of this little fella. And one of the allied health workers said, well, you got an assessment for so-and-so, don't think you're going to get an assessment for this one too. Well, sorry too much. Allied health need to know this, that you cannot place children in care. You cannot place children legally in special schools unless you have assessments on them. So they are violating the child's rights totally over and over again by not giving them an assessment. In fact, when we got an assessment on one child, we found in the assessment the child has a diagnosis, and I always don't go with these diagnoses, of emerging psychosis linked to paranoia. He thinks the world is unsafe. Well, he saw his mother killed at three. He saw his auntie killed, who was his carer at nine. So he might have a reason to think the world is unsafe. That he has suicide ideation. He's been hospitalised twice for suicide attempts and each time the verdict of the hospital he was just attention seeking. That he has complex grief. And finally, different to complex grief, he has compounded post-traumatic stress. This little, little fellow of 13. So we do need assessments and then we can work out how we can get the real services in pl into place. So as we stand up and speak out, we challenge people to change.
We actually force them to change. So I'm going to challenge you. 1,100 people can leave this conference and change the lives of many children, their families and communities. I don't believe that government can listen to us. I don't believe they have the capacity to truly hear us as we speak out on behalf of our children. So I've decided that I am going to go back and engage with this mob, that as we work together on behalf of all our children, their families and their communities and the Aboriginal organisations who are slogging it out there really hard, that it is time to walk back in there and engage with this mob because, you know what, I'm shit scared come September, that we're going to have a, rep a, a, a repetition of what we've had before. So my challenge to you in this closing is that uh, we take the opportunity to go out and stand tall, as we asked our children to do, that we remember our children are not our future. We are our children's future. It is what we do today now that will determine their future. I want to close by saying there is always a dream dreaming us. This country came from the dreaming. We emerged from the ground and we came from the dreaming that long time ago. You said they're harmless dreamers and they're loved by the people. What I asked you was harmless about being a dreamer and what I asked you was harmless about loving the people or loving children. Revolution only needs good dreamers who can remember their dreams. I would hope that you each have a dream that one day we will have passed on the baton and that we will be able to say that we've done everything possible to not just protect our children, but to give them a future that will be creative and beautiful and they will be able to lead this country as it moves into the future. Thank you.